the prophecies in all of human history and only two fundamental prophecies. A prophet called Tahara and a prophet called Kedusha. The prophet of Tahara is a prophet which removes the blemish and the kilko that we have gotten through our Chatonim, our sins. The prophet of Kedusha refers to the prophet where new Kedusha or new power, new spiritual forces are brought down to the person so that he can use that power and create Olam Haba. That's the prophet of Kedusha. He has said very basically that Adam Rishon, when he was first created on the first day, only related to the prophet of Kedusha. Basically because it was simply his task to take the world that he had, transform it into a new world by transforming that substance. He would have done that by doing the mitzvah. By doing the mitzvah, he would have brought down a new Kedusha, a new force, a new power into the world. The world would have elevated to a new status called Olam Haba. So Adam Rishon when he was first made, was only connected to the prophet of Kedusha. When Adam sinned, then the prophet of Tahara came into being. And essentially what the prophet of Tahara was, is that when Adam sinned, he brought in the evil residue into the world itself. So that whereas before it was simply a force that had the ability to seduce him, now it became a force that literally resided in his neshama, in his guf, and in the world at large. What was the damage of that? The damage of that was that since the evil resided in his neshama, the neshama could no longer have the power to transform the world. Because even if the neshama would bring down new spiritual forces, new kedusha, it would not have the power to transform the world because the evil residue would simply block any ability of the neshama to be mazachich or purify all reality. The damage that was done to the guf was that since the evil residue or the zoma went into the guf, the guf could no longer be mizdachich. The guf was itself no longer able to be transformed. So even if the neshama had the full power, the guf would not respond. Because it had an alien tumor in, in it. The damage that was done to the world, the same thing. The world was not capable of transformation because of the zoma or the evil residue that, was, that rested within it. So basically, the tilkul, which is the damage that was done through the chayt, was the existence of zoma or evil residue, in all reality itself. Completely foiling any potential of zikhoa. That's it. What the Bodhisattva then did was, was initiate a rehabilitative process. In order to initiate a rehabilitative process, we involve ourselves in two steps. First, the Bodhisattva had to undo the damage of the Zorma, which means that he had to eradicate the evil residue which existed now on the Neshama of Adam, in the Guf of Adam, and in the world. He had to take that out, number one. And number two, he had to then allow the possibility of new Kedusha descending again. So essentially what the Bodhisattva did was to undo the same thing that Adam Rishon did. Just like Adam Rishon went from a state of Sahara, a state of purity, or be it a state of Khasan, an inadequacy, to a state of Kilkul, the Bodhisattva had to reverse the entire thing and remove the damage and allow him to in a certain sense start all over again. That's basically what we said. I don't think there are any questions on that. Now, what we have said basically is, uh, is the following is that these two prophecies, which now exist because of the hate of Adam Rishon, really refer to the Messianic prophecies. And that's a surprise to many people. The Messianic process, in essence, is nothing more than the process which allows man to transform his world and create Olam Haba. That is the Messianic process. The Messiah himself is no more the individual who is the apex or the climax of that process. He's the man who comes in and puts the finishing touch to it. That's all he is. The actual Mashiach is the man who comes at the end of the process and puts in the finishing touch. If Adam had not sinned, he would have brought in the Kedusha and he would have transformed the world. In that role, he would have been the Mashiach. Because he was the man that would have done that job. He would have accomplished that Tikkun. Therefore, he would have been the Mashiach. After he did the sin, that possibility no longer existed because Sahara became necessary. Which means that the process of existential elevation was split in two parts.
part. First, the Dharma or the evil residue had to be removed, and then the Kedusha had to again be brought down. So therefore, what happened was, was that the process, or the Messianic process, was divided into two. The Messianic process, which is essentially responsible for elevating the world from a state of chesan, inadequacy, to a state of perfection or shlemus by the in- introduction of Kedusha, is called Mashiach ben David. Why is it called Mashiach ben David? Because later on, that power was uniquely invested in David HaMelech. We will go into this later on, why it was associated with him, but simply that process is akin or identical with the process called Mashiach ben David. The process which elevates the world from a state of Chesor to a state of Shlemus and creates Olam Haba is called Mashiach ben David. The other process which removes evil residue or Zerma and allows the world to become purified, albeit still in an in in inadequate state, it's only in a purified state, is also a messianic process, and that's referred to as Mashiach ben Yosef. Why is it called Mashiach ben Yosef? Because that process became uniquely identified with Yosef HaTzadik later on. And we will get into that also as we go into series 3. How these two individuals... What? Distinction of what? Of these two processes? The messianic process of Mashiach ben David is associated with the, with the, the need to elevate the world to a level of Olam Haba, to transform material reality into a spiritual reality itself. The process of Mashiach ben Yosef is a process which is not concerned with that. It's concerned with undoing the damage of hate. And the damage of hate was the fact that the Zorma, or the evil residue, entered the world and made it incapable of being transformed. So there has to be a separate process which cleanses all reality from that evil residue, <coughs> you see. So therefore, the process of Mashiach and Yosef is a cleansing process. That's all it is. It's a cleansing process. It's a purifying process. It is not a transforming process. The transforming process that goes from materialism to spiritualism is called Mashiach and David. Well, okay, we'll get now. Those are the concepts. Now, how are they manifest in time? Very basically, this is what we discussed last week. Since the case of Adam Rishon, the British has given 6,000 years for that process to be finished. What process? Everything. From the time that Adam Rishon was made until the year 6,000, everything must be done. The British has allowed physical reality, the entire universe, to exist only for 6,000 years. Now that sounds very strange, because you can't hear that the world is more than 6,000 years old. Well, the world is not more than 6,000 years old, but I don't want to go into the entire, all the scientific aspect of it and so on. The world is at present only 5,746 years, even though it looks like it's billions of years. And the simplest answer that's given, which is the really the true answer, is the following, and I'll just drop this so that there shouldn't be any confusion in your mind. When God created the world, when the Buddha first created the world, he created man, Adam. How old was Adam when he was created? Was he an infant? No. Adam Rishon was 21 years old. At the outset, at birth, meaning at creation, he was a full adult. He was 21 years old. Or rather, I'm sorry, 20 years old. 21 is the voting age. <laughs> yeah. Adam, was, Adam was 20 years old. Okay, he was 20 years old. He was a full adult, capable of complete free will. Now, Adam Rishon was created as a full man. And just like Adam was created at 20, the world was created at 20. But doesn't mean the world was actually created at 20. The world was created in its fully matured state. Now, if the world had been allowed to evolve in a fully matured state, maybe it would have taken several billion years. Nobody's denying that. Just like, in order for man to evolve to 20, it takes 20 years of a great deal of biological effort. But what the Bonishim did was he created everything in its adult stage at the outset. So that when you examine Adam and you look at him, you say, hey, you're 20 years old. You must have been around for 20 years. And the other would say, no, I was just born today. <coughs> it's the same thing. If you would examine the world, you would say, well, this world looks like it's 5 billion years or 3 billion years or whatever the story is. So the other would say, no, that's not true. It appears that way because the world was created with that scope of maturity. Except that it was created at its adult stage, as, as if it was at the end of the process. 
You see what I'm saying? Now I won't go into all the other discussions, Kepler, that's quite lengthy and involved, about all the different aspects of aging and so on, and all the different uh, difficulties between science and the Torah, they all can all be easily basically resolved. But I don't, I don't, you know, this is not the place to go into it. But I'm simply saying here that from the time that others created, there's only 6,000 years which is allowed for this process. In other words, the world must have acquired all the Kedusha that's necessary in order to transform the world by the year 6,000. In addition, whatever sins were done had to have been cleaned up by the year 6,000. Okay? So that year 6,000 is a very important number because that tells us that the world will stop and stop in that year. This world will not go on for more than 254 years. When is that that's not, that's, there I go. The point is that this world will not go on longer than another 250, uh, 250, uh, four years. Now, how is the process of Tahar and Kedusha manifest or applied throughout the time? Very simply. What happens is that the two run concurrently. Now, we will get into that shortly, as soon as I finish this, to show why they run, must run concurrently. But essentially, you would think that they would run consecutively, but they really run concurrently. First, the process of Tahara, so that a certain number of years is given for the, all the Nishamash of all the people to become Torah again. Then, after that, the process of the Tahara Tagur, which is Kriya Samaitan. When all of the Jews would have completed the fast, would they cleanse themselves of all the sins that they have acquired throughout all the time that they've been around, that would be called the Imos Mashiach. And that's what the Imos Mashiach is. The Imos Mashiach is nothing more than the power of all the Nishamas of Khalifah. Hence, a whole new consciousness will arise at that time. The next step is Tawat Agot, which is Tia Samaitan. Hence, all the Jews and all those living things will all die at the same time. For minimally one hour and then be all resurrected and put into new bodies and start all over in that sense. In other words, what, at the time of Kriya Samaitan, which takes place after the Yomot Mashiach, sometimes inside of it, at that point starts an incredible age because death is no longer existent at that point. When the Kriya Samaitan takes place, all Jews will live without any death. There will be no death for people, for any form of animal life and all the biological, chemical, and physical processes that relate to the death-like deteriorated processes will also disappear. So all signs, texts will have to change. That's the discussion we had. I, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, we'll go into that in series when we talk about Goyim. That's a problematical thing. The third stage is what's called the Yom Hadin. At the year 6000, what happens? Yom Adin. What's Yom Adin? The ultimate day of trial. That's the day which is at the end in which every living creature, every living being will go in front of the Bez and Shemal, the Yom Adin, the Gunashon, to decide whether or not they're capable of going to Oedem Haba. It's quite an awesome and frightening day. Now, what's happening until the year 6000? Until the year 6000, we are all involved in mitzvahs, constantly. So why was he involved in Sahara through different stages, and I won't go into the part of Sahara, we've gone to that before, we were also involved in the part of Kedusha. Except that a strange thing would happen. Whereas originally, other mission was created as one person who was to do the transformation process by himself, because of the fact that he failed, that process was then fragmented, and his neshama was split, and those Chalakim became different people. Which means that the job of Kedusha and the job of Sahara became distributed to something called humanity. Whereas the other mission was humanity himself. Now humanity would be consisted of many different individuals. But the sum total always remains the same. You see. So whereas other mission had the Neshama, which had the ability to transform all of reality, now that power would be distributed in his, in his totals, in his descendants. And they would have collectively the power to transform all reality. So that no single person would anyone have the power that other mission has. That's why when any of you sin, you don't damage the entire world. You only damage yourself on a certain piece of it. You don't have the power to destroy reality like Adam had. But that also means that since everyone now has smaller fragmented power, he also has a much smaller chalik in Olam He has much less reward. Since when you've got to split the pie among more people and the pie remains the same, each one gets less of a portion. And that's what it is. 
The basic only of other mission was the fact that he would never enjoy Olam Abba as a single individual. And that's an incredible, incredible punishment. He would now have to enjoy Olam Abba in a collective sense of humanity. So that each person now is able to enjoy it in a much more fractional part. And that was a fundamental onus that was never undone. So therefore, the part of Kedusha, or the part of doing mitzvahs, was now distributed among many people, you see. But as we go along history, we see that as people do mitzvahs, they also do Averis. So as they're bringing down Kedusha, also, by doing mitzvahs, they're doing Chathayim, and those Chathayim need Tahara. So what we find is that these two parts are going along concurrently. So that each person, as he lives, he is obligated to do mitzvahs, and he is obligated to attempt to connect himself to the Bona Shalom, to be double to the Bona Shalom, and bring down a certain amount of Kedusha to the world. But at the same time, he's going to also be making mistakes. You see, he's going to be sinning. So that the path of power will be taking place also, concurrently with the Kedusha. So therefore, every person's life, every instance of every person's life, is always comprised of events that have to do with Kedusha, in the sense that certain mischievous that have to do with you, or events that have to do with Sahara. And that's essentially what it's all about. What happens at the end of 6,000? Well, we've said that last time, but I'm not going to go into that because that's not important. What I'd like to discuss now why these two have to occur concurrently and not consecutively. In other words, logically, logically, before a person can move into an apartment, before he can move into an apartment, he has to first clean it out. He has to clean it out from the mess that the previous tenants left. Once he cleans out the mess that he moves in, and he decorates his own way. That is akin to consecutive tikkunim. First you clean out the place, and then you decorate it, you improve it. That means first you clean it out, that's called Sahara, and then you decorate it, that's called Kedusha. But that's not what happens. What the Buddha made men do is to clean out and decorate the apartment at the same time. That's essentially what's going on. In other words, men have to atone for their sins, to use to trials and so on, at the same time as they also elevate their beings in terms of Kedusha. The Buddha shall put the two processes concurrently. <coughs> in other words, the two messianic ideas occur concurrently. That's what happens. They come together. Not consecutively. Logically, it should have been consecutively. But instead, it's concurrently. And I'd like to take this last session for this series to discuss why. The answer which we're going to give tonight, the reasoning of what you're going to give tonight really answers something else which is very startling and that is it is the beginning of an attempt to understand why the Hanogat HaYichod works the way it does that's really what we're saying now I don't know how many people are, are really can relate to what I've just said because the Hanogat HaYichod is the deepest of all the prophecies the Hanogat HaYichod is the process or the Anhogat is the series of activities from the Bunishon which is concerned essentially with rehabilitating reality. The Hanukkah HaMishpat is really concerned with elevating reality. So in a certain way, the Hanukkah HaMishpat relates to the process of Kedusha, and the Hanukkah HaYichud relates to the process of Tahara. That is not an exact rule. But as far as we're concerned, there are strong parallels. And clearly, the process of Tahara takes place in a certain way. Now, the question here is the following. Why does the Kedush and the Tumah flow in the same series of time? More specifically, we have said that the Anukhah Yichud works in a very strange fashion. What is that? It works in the following way. When Adam Arishan did a sin, when he did the first sin, what happened to the world? What happened to his reality? What happened to the reality was that it became darker. When the Bunishim said to Adam that from now on you have to work, the day of the Pechah by the sweat of your brow you must work, and he said that from now on many things will change, what the Bunishim was saying basically was that the world is now much darker. The entity of Zoma into the world 
is a very unique type of phenomenon. What it means is that when the Zohar entered the world, it means that suddenly it is much more difficult now to come in contact with spirituality. Much more difficult. That's essentially what the consequences of the Zohar are. What does that mean? That means it's very difficult to see the hand of God. Before Adam did the Chet, it was very clear that the God was who made the world. It was very clear where the world came from. It was very clear because the world operated automatically on its own. Adam didn't have to do anything. Adam never had to plow or plant or harvest anything. Where did Adam get his food from? From the Ghan. It's like, almost like money trees. In a certain sense, Ghan Eden was like the only example of a real money tree. But it wasn't a money tree, it was a food tree. All the taste of the Ghan and the entire environment simply created food or whatever Adam wanted for the asking. Adam had no work at all. There was no such thing as physical work. It was alien to Adam. He didn't have to work the fields. Or there was no such thing as agriculture in Adam before the Chay. It just sprung out of the ground, whatever Adam wanted. Hence, if it sprung out of the ground, it was very clear, you see, that this was coming from somewhere else. But once Adam was said, told, that he has to develop the ground, and he has to bring forth the fruit, he has to control the reality, then the hand of God became invisible. Why? Because once you become involved in agricultural processes, once you become involved so that you become a producer, it's very easy to begin to deceive yourself and say, I'm the one who's responsible. What the Bonishan did was that he made other Mauritian a partner to himself. The Bonishan made other Mauritian a partner to himself in the exploitation and the mastery of physical reality. Now you may say that sounds great, but that was his undoing. Because once other Mauritian became involved in the exploitation of physical reality, that means now the possibility of Adam deceiving himself and the entry of his arrogance entered the world. Adam was never able to be arrogant before because he had nothing to do with producing anything. So where is he going to be arrogant about? About what? But now he was able to be arrogant. Now for the first time he can enter into the possible belief Hey, wait a minute. I'm the one who plows the ground. And I did. Somehow reality works because I make it work. Isn't that true? I make it work. The British from forced men to come into contact with the world. He forced them to interact with the world and the world to respond only after men, in some way, manipulated it. That was a very, very serious thing. And what that did was that with God withdrew even further from the world. So it was a kosher that entered the world. Do we understand? A very deep kosher. The more man is allowed to become master of the world, Rather, the more he thinks he becomes master of the world, the more chokhmah and wisdom man obtains about the world and is able to exploit the world technologically in whatever way, the further God goes. Because what it simply means is that the British is simply digging a bigger and bigger hole for the man to fall in. That's really what it is. So what we see is that the major consequence of sin or the major consequence of hate is what? Is the withdrawal of Kedusha and the ascendancy of darkness, Chosha, Hester. Do we see? Now that's a strange thing. You see, it's strange that if a man fails to do something, you think that, well, if he fails to do something, bring more light in. Don't make it more darker. Don't make it more difficult. If the man had a problem doing the mitzvah under certain conditions, well, don't make it more difficult. You see? But that's exactly what another thing you could do. What another thing you could do is stipulate that every time there's a hate in the world, there is more kosher. That is called, technically, the key buzzword on that is called Tigboros Horah. Tigboros means Tigboros means the ascendancy or the empowerment of evil. The more men sin, the more powerful evil becomes. Meaning, the darker the world becomes, the greater the hester, the greater the, the, the less the ability to perceive spirituality. We are now holding almost here. We've come a long way from Adam, haven't we? Now, if you look at the world in terms of the culture, it's enormous. 
Our world is so dark, and man has been given such incredible power to deal with his reality, that almost everyone says, where is God? And that there's actually a movement that says, God is dead. Nihilism. God is dead. Why? Because where is his presence? Where do you see God's presence at all? So one of the critical features of Tibor Torah is the ability of man to become more and more trapped in the illusion of mastery. Another characteristic of Tibor Torah is the progressive elimination of justice. What am I talking about? When there's a world, and in that world, the just, or those who are good and righteous, get rewarded, and those who are evil, get punished. Would you call that a world of justice? Yes. In a world of justice, we know that there's a shaper, there's a judge, who runs the world. We can see the objective, the objective of the world is mishpah, is justice, and the world runs upon the justice. But look out there, do you see justice? Do you see good people in good situations, and bad people in bad situations? Do you people, see people who are from very much very successful, and people who are not from, not? On the contrary, the old question, why is that the good suffer and the evil prosper? Why do we ask that question? Because when you look outside in reality, that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what's going on. What creates it? Why does God do that? Why does He allow the world to begin to mirror the appearance of lack of justice? That's part of the world's law. That's also kosher. That darkness. And that's the withdrawal of the hand of God. This version says, I don't want you to recognize that I'm behind the world. I don't want you to know it. Really. So I will allow the world to look chaotic. That's another way he does it. So therefore we look at the world and we see enormous evil. We see evil all around us. Evil people, evil events. And they're totally successful. These are all different manifestations of Tibor Sarah. A third manifestation of Tibor Sarah, which is very important, the ascendancy of the body and the decline of the neshama. That's hard for us to understand, because all of us are part of the situation, so we can't really understand that we've been reduced. But, as I've said many times, the basic concept is, is that you are a combination of guf and neshama, and therefore, you are a combination of two different sets of drives. What set of drives becomes more and more powerful in ratio depends on you. And another principle of Tikkur Sarai is, is that the more man sins, the more ascendant and powerful the good becomes. That means what? For the world. It means that the world becomes more and more consumed with satisfying bodily needs, satisfying emotional needs that relate to narcissism and relate to need gratification. That's what happens. And the world is not so concerned with the wisdom and chokhmah and righteousness. These are minimal things and they become irrelevant. So that most people in the world become anti-intellectual or pseudo-intellectual or non-intellectual. And everybody, but everybody, is after a good time. <coughs> again we see our ascendancy. And this is again all part of Tibor Salah. So Tibor Salah is a real powerful principle. It is the principle of the Yichud, and it's based on the fact that the more you sin, the more darkness enters the world. That is the correct result. And I describe to you three different ways that that darkness enters the world. Why does this happen? Why is it that the consequence of sin is greater and greater darkness, greater and greater tumor, so that it becomes more and more difficult to do the mitzvahs? What is the main effect when the world becomes darker and the existence of God becomes more and more invisible? It becomes harder and harder to become from. It becomes more and more difficult to be righteous and to be honest and to be intelligent and to be wise, isn't it? When the entire world is out there trying to do everything but be just and everything but be honest and everything but be self-sacrificing, it's very hard enough to want to do that. 
which means that the existence of the Choshech, or the existence of the Tumor, the Zorm on the world, which creates this Choshech, makes it very, very difficult to what? To do mitzvahs. It makes it very difficult to believe in God, or to want to associate with God. Today, it's, it's, it's almost humiliating to associate with God, or to be called religious. You always have to apologize in these, for these, in these times. As if there's something wrong or embarrassing about it. Oh, he's an old-fashioned guy. One of the guys that still clings to the old ideas of, of the ancients. That there's a God who owns the world and that God is, is in power to do and we can do nothing. Man is powerless. <coughs> but fundamentally, the Tikbur Salah affects our ability of, to do mitzvahs. And our ability to do mitzvahs is essentially attached to what process? The process of Kedusha. That means it becomes more and more difficult for us to transform the world to make an Olam Haba. The more sins we do, the more difficult it is to make Olam Haba. Which means that if we want to create an Olam Haba, we've got to rest Olam Haba, not from a state of emptiness, but from a state of perversion. We have to rescue the world, not from inadequacy, but from chilkel, from damage, from tumor. That's the meaning that the two processes are concurrent. It means that the Kedusha is affected by the Tahara, and since the Tahara takes place with greater and greater degrees, you see, of evil in the world, greater and greater degrees of punishment and tumor in the world, and the Kedusha must always occur concurrently. Well, that Kedusha is being affected. It's more and more difficult to do the mitzvah. It's more and more difficult to become, to, uh, to become aware of a divine being, you see to elevate ourselves to a, to a different type of person. That's what it means. If Tahara was not done that way, if Tahara was done first, then all the difficult and evil things in the world come first to remove the blemishes and the damage to be done, and then the Kedusha would come after. Kedusha alone as a process doesn't have to deal with Koshech. Other reason before he sinned was an incredible pristine environment. There was no Koshech. It would be very, very simple for him to do that mitzvah. You see. Because there was no involvement of kosher. Because there was no tahara. These things did not exist. There was no tumor. It was only because of the sin that now tahara had to take place. But tahara is built on kosher. It's built on evil force coming in to eradicate the evil that exists. It's built on a whole different set of principles. This must affect then the Kedusha. If the Kedusha happens concurrently. So now... We come back again to the question. It's not a question, why do these things, two things happen concurrently? You know, intellectually. Why does it happen concurrently? It is a much more profound question. Because of the fact that these two happen concurrently, it means that it is much more difficult for the Kedusha to take place. That's what it means. You see, the concurrent ikunum, the concurrent existence of these two processes means that Kedusha, the ability to transform the world, is very, very, progressively more and more difficult. So why is it going to make the processes consecutive and not concurrent? Okay, I've simply asked the question and I've amplified the question. Do we understand this? I'm not going to ask anyone to attempt a solution. Hold on, I'm tempted. Since everyone seems to be so sad, so... I don't know, so knowledgeable here, I don't know. The answer is very, very subtle. And it is based on the following statement. If these two prophecies did not occur concurrently, they would not occur at all. It is simple as that. In other words, if Kedusha wasn't married to Tahara, there would be no Kedusha anymore. Other would have been annihilated instantly, without a second chance. That is the answer. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with Chuva, even without Chuva. Was not to the fact that Tahara faith, was not to the fact that Tahara did not take place along with the Kedusha, Adam would have been annihilated. Now, why is that? In order to understand that, you have to understand something about the basis of existence itself. And what it means that all of you exist. And if you grasp this idea, 
you will be well ahead in understanding the true power that every person really possesses. Spider goes ahead and constructs its own web. 
magnificent job. If you ever look at a web. Do you see spiders going to web school? <laughs> Intermediate webbing and advanced webbing. Do you see such a thing? I've never seen that. One good. What's that? Series three webbing. Series three webbing. Do you see this? I've never seen that. Have you ever seen, for example, a beaver go to school? How to construct his little hut? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen a bird taking geography lessons, navigation lessons, and how to find the place where he has to hibernate? I mean, where he has to migrate? Do you ever see that? So how do these animals know what to do? Because there is a fundamental principle in all being. When the Buddha can create a certain being, right, he instills within that entity, within that being, the information that it needs to survive. Number one. And he also instills within that being the desire to survive. Now, if this was done for the, all the animal kingdom, was it done for men? Yes. Except that none of us recognize it. All of us, if our goal is to achieve spirituality, do we have a drive for that? Yes. Except that it's not recognized. But you have a very powerful drive to enhance your being. You do. Except that there's one thing that the person did with a person that he did not do with anything else. All of the creatures have one desire in one direction. Man has one desire in two directions. Hence, man can become very confused on how to fulfill his one desire. The Neshama knows only one thing. Get bigger, get stronger. How does the Neshama know that? Very simple. What does the Neshama feel like when it's in a state of shlemus? How does it feel? It feels satisfied. It feels complete. Like you've just finished a seven-course dinner. Do you have any appetite whatsoever? No. Can you think of food? Not really. Well, I'm saying a a seven-course dinner, that's good, and that's been, you know, very appetizing, and you're satisfied. You finish it, that's it, that's the end of your your hunger. No more. You're in a state of shlamus with respect to hunger. You see. So the state of shlamus means that you feel satisfied with respect to whatever criteria we're talking about. Since the Neshama in the state of Shlemus possesses you the sufficient amount of Kedusha, what you have, it feels satisfied, it feels whole, it feels right. When the Buddhist takes away its Kedusha, what happens? And becomes the song, what happens? It feels empty, it feels like it lost something, just like you feel when you're hungry. Why do you feel hungry? Because the body, where does that feeling come from? The body suddenly begins to scream, I'm missing something, I need fuel. Fuel. And the register goes up in the brain, fuel, and suddenly, hunger. Now why does the body seem fuel? Because the body needs fuel to go on. So the body mechanically, by itself, knows when it experiences that, when it's missing that. And it registers a certain feeling. That's a feeling of hunger. A feeling of hunger is a certain feeling of chasson, with respect to food. Now, the Nishama also feels that. When the Neshama was placed in a state of Kosan, it suddenly felt an enormous desire to eat, but not eat food, to eat Kedusha, if I may use the term. It felt the enormous desire to what? To begin to absorb Kedusha. That's what happens. The Neshama wants to absorb Kedusha. It desperately needs it. Just like you need to eat. But what does the Bonisham do? The Bonisham, in the case of the Neshama, confused it and the person. He confused it. Because what he did was, he allowed the person to think that he could be getting the Kedusha that he really needs in other ways. He merged the Guf, the body and the Neshama, into one kind of direction. So that a person thinks that by getting a better suit of clothes, and by getting more money, and by becoming more and more important to, in, in, in the world, and getting a bigger business, he suddenly has the Kedusha that he needs. Now you may say, what does that have to do Kedusha? What is material success? Recognition has to do Kedusha. Because as I was explained in a shir about a month ago, material success and all the satisfaction that come with it is simply the wrong registration of Kedusha. It's really the desire for Kedusha in the wrong way. And the Bodhijam has allowed the person to deceive himself because he's created something called the Yitzhara which gives the person a sense of satiation in material world that actually satisfies the Neshama as well. We discussed the mechanism of that a while back. 
But that's what's critical. What's critical is that the drive exists, it exists in the Neshama. But that the Yitzhah has the ability to deceive the person and his Neshama and create the illusion that the need for Kedusha has been satisfied by fulfilling the needs of the body. Do we see the point? That is the essence of the Yitzhah. The essence of the Yitzhah means that it allows the Neshama, the person, to feel the shameless through material fulfillment. Now, what happens? What happens to the person that does a chet? What happens to the person that does a chet? He goes down to a third state. A state called tuko. That's what happens. What kind of state is that? That's not a state of emptiness. That's not a state of hunger. It's not a state where you feel a need anymore. It's a state where you feel there's something wrong. You feel sick. You feel impure. That is a different state. There is something wrong. There is a pathology that exists. Do you see the difference? That's the difference between a state of Kilko and a state of Hassan. Now, does the in the shop, or does a person in the state of Kilko know that he's in the state of Kilko? Yes. He does. But again, he can deceive himself. But basically speaking, these three different states register themselves on the existence of the entity which experiences them. And what it does is create a drive in that entity to undo that state. Meaning, it creates a drive in that entity to go back to its origin. Now, this is a very, very important principle. It is the homeostatic principle, essentially, in all existence. Everything was made from a certain origin. And then, once it was made from a certain origin, it was summer in Kedusha, Bishlemus, and you put it to Hashan, it internally has inner need to go back to the state of Shlemus. It wants to go back this way. And it knows to do that inside itself. It doesn't have to be taught. It knows that by the way it feels. Just like you know when you're hungry you've got to eat. The Neshama knows that it needs Kedusha. When it lacks Kedusha. It needs no instruction. Also, if the Neshama goes from a state of Sahara to a state of Puma, it also experiences a new state. Not lack, deficiency, but impurity, perverseness, sickness inside. And the Neshama knows that it's got to get rid of that and go up. So no matter where you put it, it will always attempt to establish its equilibrium. That's the essential principle of homeostasis. Do we understand this? Now what does all this have to do with what I've said? Okay. We are so part of that reality that we can't understand what really reality really is. Reality started out, Bishlemus, Nasser Hassan. What does that mean? Now listen very carefully. This is very subtle. When I say reality started out, Bishlemus, and then only then did it go down to these other states, it means that reality started out in a way which all of us can never even begin to conceive. What is a state of Shlemus? As I said, it's a state where the entity, the Shama, in this case, is satisfied. What does that mean, it's satisfied? It means more than it doesn't experience the need. It means that there is no such thing as change or movement or improvement in the existence of the thing. Now, catch again. Shlemus is a static state. It is stable and static. It's not capable of movement. Existence. When I say, for example, something exists. Existence. Is existence itself, the entity of existence, the process, rather not the process, existence, the act of existence, is that a stable or is that a dynamic thing? 
It's stable. To exist means to be. To be means to be static. There's no movement in existence. You're not going anywhere. Once you exist, then you exist as you exist. Your existence doesn't change. There's no reason why it should change. There's no reason why it should go up or down. To exist is to be static. To exist no matter how you were created. To exist means that you have sustained a certain level of reality and that's where you are. There's no thing that's moving higher or moving lower. There's not even a knowledge of that. All you know is you are what you are and that's all you are. It is static. That is the true essence of existence. The true essence of existence is totally static. Now, you people will struggle with what I'm saying. Why? Because none of you exist in that way. All of us exist as dynamic beings. It means we struggle to change, to move, to go somewhere. We're constantly trying to improve or to go somewhere. We're in motion. The existence that we know is an existence of movement. I don't mean actual, nothing physical movement, linear spaceship. I mean psychological movement. We grow, we develop. You see, we constantly change from level to level. Our consciousness, our awareness changes at every second, every day. We're a different type of person in some way. We've come across new thoughts, new realities, you see. And we're not the same person from one day to the next. So therefore, the essence of our reality is what's called dynamic features. Meaning that within the existence itself lies the ability of that existence to move to different levels of existence. Existence itself has the capacity to change. That's the way we exist. We exist. It's not that we exist and that we can change. It's much deeper than that. We were created with a kind of existence which has the capacity to change. If you see what I'm saying? We think that existence is the way it is. You see? That this is what existence means. You exist and you change. You grow. You become richer. You become smarter. You become poorer. You're always moving. You know what I mean? You're never staying the same. And we think that that's the nature of existence. That existence participates in change. That's not true. Real and true existence never changes. It is static. Because it is complete by itself. If existence has nowhere to go, then it has, doesn't have the ability to go. Because it is already perfect. Hence it doesn't know the concept of movement, or going, or becoming. The word becoming doesn't exist for a shlemistic being. Only the word being. Do we understand this? The word is to be. When you're with shlemist, you are. There's no such thing as you can become. What does that mean, become? That's an absurdity in the world of shlemist. Because in the world of Shlemus, everything that you are, you are now. And that's it. There's nothing within your entity that can change in any sense. You can't become something. You say to a 10 year old kid, what do you want to become when you get, a, when you get older? I want to become a doctor. You say to an adult, what do you want to do with yourself? I want to realize my potential. Hogwash! Nothing is realizing potential for being that Shlemus. Because its potential is its existence. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It's there. That which is Bishlamus has arrived. But the fact that it's arrived is inscribed in its very nature. You see what I'm saying? Hence it doesn't know what its entire confines that it can go anywhere. It doesn't have the desire to go anywhere. And its existence doesn't even create the possibility of going anywhere. That's what true Shlamus means. It is the act of being as being. When the body is created... The notion, when the Buddhism said that because of the problem of non super, because I want you to allow you to create your own Olam Haba, because I want you to produce your own reality, the Buddhism created an existence which never was. This is the point. It's not that the Buddhism took away the Kedusha from the Shama and hence became glass and therefore now experiences hunger. It's much deeper than that. That's kid stuff. What really happens is the following, is that when the Buddhism says in the Shama, I was born in Kedusha, the Buddhism says, I am converting you into a whole different type of existence. You are no longer an existence which is and which exists in a static state. You are now an existence which can change and which can grow and become. Hence, 
since I've allowed this possibility, you can become what you want to become. That's the essence of free will. That's the power. The Buddha could not have given you free will. Free will is an absurdity. Unless you have somewhere to move. Unless you have the capacity to move. It is absurd to give a person directions to go somewhere if he doesn't have feet. Or he doesn't have a car. If the Buddha says to you, I want you to exercise your free will and create a space of Olam Haba, it means that he has to give you an existence which is capable of change to become an Olam Haba. In the world of Shlemus, that never existed. It was only one world and only one world was possible. When the Buddha created the city of Gaston, he created a new type of reality that was never known before. It never existed before. Suddenly, what entered into reality or possibility is the world of becoming, to become something. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why space and time were created. In the world of Shlemus, there is no space and time. Because what is the essence of time? Time means now, tomorrow, yesterday. What is this? In reference to what? In reference to a sequence of events. What sequence of events? There's only a sequence of events when you're involved in the act of change. When something happens and then something happens after. When there's an aspect of change, then time becomes relevant. You see, in a world where there is no change, time is not relevant, or at least not the time that we know. There will be time in Olam Haba, but nothing like we have now. It's not the same form of time. Because the time that we have is a time which allows the becoming process to move in time and at duration. You see, so that you go from one day to the next, change takes place in time. And that's how you measure change. But in a world where there is no change, when existence doesn't reflect change, there is no time in that sense. It is a whole different thing called static time, which is beyond our imagination. If you think you people have problems imagining what a mouth is about, Forget about Magna Mahabharat. We can never understand what a world is like which is static in nature. That's why there is no being that can understand the nature of Olam Haba. Because Olam Haba is a static world. It's a world which never changes. And that's frightening. That is very frightening. Because look at the power that you have. You don't realize it. Right now, all of you have an empty blackboard. And I give you a piece of chalk, and you can all write whatever you want on that chalk, on that backboard. What does that mean? It means that right now, you all have existence. But you all have a kind of existence which can move from one madrega to another. You have that now. But there will become a time when you no longer will have that. Where by your madrega in the year 6000, that which you acquired becomes fixed. And it's not that the Buddhism doesn't give you the opportunity to run out and get more. No, suddenly your existence is converted so that never again will you even think of the possibility of becoming more. Because you will never be able to grow again. You will be what you are at that point. Forever. You see what I'm saying? If you realize what I just said, it is enormously terrifying. Because it means that the gift of change, the gift of becoming is something you have now. And it will be taken away from you someday. That we will again go to a different reality as we once were. This reality should never have been. We should never have had a reality of Chassan. You say, well that's great. It's not great. The Buddhism didn't want, well, in a sense, Kaviyokal didn't want the reality of Chassan. Because that's not what the real reality is. The true reality is perfect reality. It is a reality which exists perfectly as it is. And this was not capable of change. That's how the Buddhism created existence. And in that reality, that's the reality of the greatest type of Simcha. But then the Shama said, I don't want that reality. Because I'm sick. And therefore I could not have done anything to create my situation. So when the Buddhism says, okay, I will allow you. I will allow you to undo the problem of non the The Buddhism says, I will change your reality. But only temporarily. I will change your reality for 6,000 years. And that's it. The reality which can become will exist only 6,000 years. After that, there is no such thing as a reality which can become. It only is a reality which is. That's why the clock is ticking away. As that clock winds down and time goes by, you lose 
Every second, you've lost another minute, another second of the reality of becoming, of the world of becoming. But the Uda Nasi said before his dark work, he says in Tiki Yavis, he says, Toiv Shoachat, Boilem Hazer, Mikon Chayalim Abba. It is better to live one hour in this world than to live in the entire Olam Haba. Why was he saying that? Because he said what essentially is the fact. Once Olam Haba is over, that's it. One hour in this world, one hour now in this room, you have more power than all creation in Olam Haba. Because you can create in this world of change. You are God, so to speak. In this world of becoming, you are like a god because you can change and you can produce. You can literally create. But in the world of Olam Haba, you are no longer a god, so to speak. Or I should say, you are like a god in a different way. Because you are then in a perfect state of fixation. Just like the Buddhism is. God doesn't change. The Buddhism can never change. He is absolute perfection itself. You see, He's not capable of change. He doesn't move from one level to another. He doesn't get better and smarter and stronger. It's not possible with the Bershom. The Bershom is already at the apex or the pinnacle of perfection. Hence the nature of his existence is absolute static to the greatest degree. And that really is where it's at. The Bershom created the world like him in the beginning in a sense that the world was static and perfect in its being. But to resolve the problem of Nama Sufa, to make you your own boss, to let you buy your own business, the Buddhism changed the nature of existence to a dynamic becoming one. Do we understand this? I hope so. Because it's a very, very critical idea. But there's another very critical idea, because we still haven't answered our question, have we? The other idea is the following, and this is the terrifying aspect. When the Abhanisham said to other Mauritians, he said, I will allow you to go from becoming to being, from a dynamic to a state, but I will give you the choice so that you can choose which direction you want to go, right? Where did he tell this to Adam? Adam knew this, but Adam also knew this by virtue of his inner drive. His neshama told him, in a sense, what he had to achieve. Adam wanted to go up in Kedusha by virtue of what his neshama said itself. Except that Adam was confused of how to achieve that Kedusha. And that's where the Yetzir came in. Now, what does that mean? When the Buddhism says to Adam, or to the Shema, I will make you Hassan, and I will make you deficient, and I will give you the reality of becoming, so that you can then choose. Reality was given a certain energy to become. To move, you need energy on a physical level. But for the Shema to grow, to acquire Kedusha, it needs a certain amount of energy on a spiritual level, however that's manifest. It's a Kodak which is given to the Shema, and it's given to it through its existence. In other words, when the Buddha Shum took the Neshama from Shleim to Hassan and reduced it and made it efficient, he changed its reality. But in changing its reality, he also gave it drive to establish its homeostasis, to go back to where it was before. But that drive and the change of its reality also gave it energy within its being to make that leap. When the Neshama was reduced from Shleim to Hassan, It was given, at the same time, as it was reduced, it was given the ability to become. But in that ability to become, lies the energy to become. It has the capacity for the movement. You see. When Adam was placed with a gun, and the Buddhism gave him a choice, which way to go? Adam chose the wrong way. What does that mean? Think of it. What happened? Adam chose the wrong thing. So therefore, what did he do with his ability to become? Did he become? Did he change? Yes. He moved. He did. Because he chose. He chose. He went into the act of choosing and he chose a specific direction. And in choosing, he exercised his free will and therefore he exercised the state of existence and he became something. 
Reality became the wrong thing. But he became, he grew in the wrong way. But he grew, you see, he changed. Make no mistake, just because he chose wrong, it doesn't mean that he didn't become something. He grew. But the problem is the following. Once he exercised his choice, and he became whatever he became, you see, what happened to his existence? What is the nature of existence? After it's been what? After it's been spent. It's over. What Farjim said to Adam, I give you one mitzvah. And he gave Adam Rishon the choice to do that one mitzvah. And he didn't know clearly how to do that. And he chose the wrong way. Adam spent his allowance. His existence had the ability to do one mitzvah. To become with respect to one act of free will. When Adam performed that act of free will, he spent the energy involved as an existence, which gave him the capacity to do it. But he spent it, which means that once other mission chose the wrong thing, he spent his money on the wrong thing. It's like the Buddha says, I will give you $20. Don't spend it. But once you spent the $20, if you take the $20 and you threw it down the sewer, you lost the $20. You, that's it. I don't know what you did with the twenty dollars. I told you to go buy something with it instead you threw it down the sewer. But that's it, I only gave you twenty dollars. But the twenty dollars that the Bonishan gave all the mission was in the nature of his existence itself. In his existence itself, which had the facet of becoming, also had the amount of the capacity to become. It had within the existence itself the act of becoming and the amount of energy which will allow that single act to take place. When Adam chose, he spent his energy. You know what it's like? It's like a spring, a coil. When you take a spring and you compress it, right? It now has what's called potential energy, you see. When a spring is whole, when it's complete, it has no energy at all. You put it on a table, it doesn't jump anywhere. Because it's a state of static state. It's a static form. It has no mechanical energy, you see. But if you take that spring and you confine it, you condense it, right? What happens? In that state, it is a state of tension. It wants to release itself. It wants to spring. It wants to release that energy. It wants to become. It wants to become that which it wants before. What was it before? It was a spring free. You shortened it. It now has the desire and it has the energy within it to become again. Now, once you let go of that spring, it jumps up. But let's say, for example, you have that spring and you condense it and there are two different directions. And I say to you, well, let that spring become, you see. You know, what I've done is I take the spring and I've shortened it. I've really coiled it so that's now tense. But I say, I want the spring in a certain direction. I just don't want it to spring anywhere. You see? So let's say, for example, I allow it to spring and it goes in the wrong place. Well, that's it. The spring has no extension energy. It's unwound. What do you do with it? It's gone. That's the same thing with other machines. The Buddhism took other machines in the Shama, so to speak, and wound it up. Because when it's not wound, it's perfect, it's complete. When you wound it up, by taking away Kedusha, it's now in a state of tension. It now knows where it's supposed to go. It has an internal drive to release itself by acquiring the Kedusha. And it also has the energy within it to do it. Everything is contained within it. It has the power to become written in it, and the energy to become inside its existence. Well, but it's only given one choice. So when Adam fails, what happens? He unwound his neshama, and after his neshama was unwound, he missed. Nothing was gone. So what do you do now? What do you do in existence like that? What do you do with a man who just sinned? A man who just spent all the energy of becoming the wrong way? The answer is, you can do nothing with it. Because that being no longer is in the same state as it was before. It's no longer in the state of becoming. It's now in a state of fixed. But it's fixed in the wrong direction. But it's lost. It's gone. That being cannot be used anymore. So what you got to do is take that spring and throw it away. You see, a neshama is not something you can keep on condensing. The Buddhism took the first neshama, unwound it, so that it became in the state of chathon. That neshama has within it the power to become. Once that power is used up, then that existence is changed. When others did the sin, or we would have done the mitzvah, in either direction. The act of doing the mitzvah of a chay, the act of choosing in free will, is nothing more than the act of changing your existence itself from becoming to being. You see? That's really what's involved. Hence, once Adam did a sin, he became. 
And once he became, he was. He entered a state of fixed being. But in the state of fixed being, he lost because he got he chose the wrong direction. Now what do you do with an Hashem like that? Nothing. The answer is, rewind it, you can't. Because it's inscribed within the Nisham itself, its ability. Once it's unwound, then it's in a different state of reality. And that's it. It's used up what it has. Hence, the only thing left for it is destruction. The Buddhism says, it's lost. You've lost your allowance, I can't do anything for you anymore. That's all. Because it's not allowance where I can sit and give you more and more money each time. The allowance is in the fiber of his being. And once he's spent that, it's gone. Because his existence is no more. He's no longer the same person. Adam Rishon, after the act of Bechir, or the act of free will, was not the same as Adam before the act of free will. He was a different entity. And that entity is no longer capable of Bechira, because it doesn't have the existence of Bechira. It has an existence, a fixed existence. And that's not the kind of existence which is necessary for free will. And Adam is void, void in himself. So that's why the Mises had been. The attitude of justice came out to Bershom, or rather Bershom says, look. The Shatan ran up to Bershom and says, look, I succeeded. I spent Adam the wrong way. And he's finished. That's all. You can't do anything with this person anymore. He's lost his fortune. It's irretrievable. You see. And the minister then says, okay, now what do we do with him? Annihilate him. Because it has nothing to do with the purpose of creation. The whole purpose of creation was to go to Shleim the so that that person would achieve Shleim again, but by its own efforts, the right way. Well, did it do it? No. So what does that have to do with all the Shleimers? Nothing. So the minister did or the attribute of justice said, annihilate him. That's it. That's why the Midas Hadin has the ability to destroy someone who does a chay. Because a chay is a transformation of existence from becoming to being. And it's the spending of the energy which is allowed that, state, that transition to take place. It's the energy of transfer. Do we see this? From this we understand why other missions should have been destroyed after his chet. Because he no longer had the existence which would allow him to go to Olam Haba. It's a subtle thing. See, we're used to looking at this like a bunch of rules and regulations. The Buddhism says, do this. You don't do this, bad boy, go home. That's not what it is. When the Buddhism says, do this, do this means that your existence is different. The Buddhism describes everything in existence itself. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The truth of the matter is there's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing. That's why man was created only as one shot. And no more than one shot. And according to Mitzvah Din, you can have no more than one shot. Because that's the nature of reality. It's serious business. Very serious business. Adam really killed himself. He really destroyed himself. And it was irrevocable. There's no way out of it. No, I want to die. That was at 930. But that's something else. That's after. What I'm talking about is what should have been. I'm talking about Adam Rishin when he sinned and what the Midas had been. What the attribute of justice demanded. What Adam Samish demanded. So the question now is, the Bunisham wants to save the situation. So what does the Bunisham do to get around it? What does he do? Now, listen to this. It's a very subtle thing, how to get around it. Do we all understand the problem? What's the solution? What it appears is that the Buddhism did the following. What did other mission lose? Essentially, by his act of free choice. By his act of our Buddha, even though it was the wrong thing, what did he lose? He lost the energy to become, didn't he? You see? And that can't be replaced, because it's spent. But wait a minute. The Buddha showed what he did was, he found another energy source. He found another energy source for Adam, and he allowed him to use it. And it's that secondary energy source which allows 
told them to go on. You know what I just said? There's a backup energy system. But the problem is, where is this energy system coming from? It's not in his own reality. It's gone. Where does the person find another backup system? He finds it in Tuma. The Koyak of Tuma is the second energy system. Yeah. Why? Why? Now, listen carefully to this. And you see... Is that a few much more? Now listen. We said that when you go from Shlem to Chaton, right? Energy goes, I mean, existence goes from being to becoming. What happens when you go from Chaton to Kilko? What happens if a being who's clean and weak becomes suddenly dirty and weak? If I may use the same vernacular. What happens? What happens? Wait a minute, please. What happens when we come dirty and weak? What happens? What happens is, is that this being feels it and it wants to go up to become clean and weak. In the same thing. Right? Which means the following. Is that when other reason was here, right? Clean and weak. And he was supposed to come clean and strong. But he lost the energy. What the Bodhisham did was, as he failed to go up here, the Bodhisham did the following. Instead of making the arrow fail, the arrow went like this. Around and down. Meaning that normally, when Adam failed to do it, he would have got nothing. He failed to do what he did. But what the Buddhism did was the following. He ordained that when a person does a sin, it's not that he would simply accomplish nothing and spent, spent his energy in a vacuum, but rather if he does something the wrong way, he will acquire Tumor. He will absorb Tumor. Now this is not part of the picture. This doesn't have to be. Because fundamentally, all of them have to do to go from Chasson to Shlemus is acquire Kedusha. It's Kedusha which is lacking. And it's Kedusha which is involved in the state of from becoming to being. From a dynamic to a fixed static state. And once Adam chose in the wrong direction, he lost the Kedusha. Hence, he should have lost his energy. And he did. He lost his energy with the, with the ability to acquire new Kedusha. That's true. But what the Bonisham said was, I'm going to do something else. If Adam does a sin, I not only... He would have lost his energy to get to Dusha. But I will give him Tumor. He will be absorbed in Tumor. Well, what happens when you become absorbed in Tumor? You are now like a spring that will suddenly rewind further down. So now you have new energy to go from Tumor it leads to becoming clean and weak. In other words, what the Bible says is that if he fails to go from here, here, I will wind the spring further down. So it leads the spring as energy to go from here to here. It was, I will put it even further back. And by putting it further back, I have, I have just want, acquired new energy. By acquiring new energy, it means that now the Neshama, which is now in a state of Tumor, it's not in a state of Chathar, it's worse, it's in a state of Tumor, now has the energy to become involved in a state of Tahara. That's all. You see. The Neshama now has the energy to go from here to here. It does not have the energy to go from here to here. Because that's spent. But it does have the energy to go from here to here, and that's exactly what the Buddhism did. He dropped it another level, right? Coiled it even further, and now gave it a new concept of energy from here to here. Now, the Nishama is back in the world of energy. Now, you may say, fine, but the only energy is to go from Tumma to Tahara. But so what the Buddhism said is the following. While you're going from Tumma to Tahara, I will also piggyback the plot of Kedusha on top of the Tahara. So that even though you don't have the energy for Kedusha alone, if Kedusha takes place at the same time as Sahara, you will have the energy. Do you see how that works? Interesting, isn't it? That's why Kedusha cannot take place without Tuma. That's why the Buddha ordained that the wage of sin is darkness. That the consequence of hate is what? It's evil. It's the residence of evil. The Buddha wants evil to come to the world if you sin. Because when evil comes in the world, it reinstates all of reality to a new state of energy. Because now it's got to go from that state up, you see. And while it's now going from Tumor to Tahara, the Buddha then doubles up, piggybacks the state of going from Chesor to Shlemus. So therefore the Buddha doubles up the two methods together. So therefore, in going from Kilko to Chesor, the Bodhisattva also associates the method of going from Chassan to Shlemus. 
and this is taking place. So now, what happens is both of these things are taking place at the same time. But really what it is, is that the Kedush is the main thing. But it is the act of Tahara which gives the energy, and it is the act of Kedusha which now gives the direction. That's why there's a Tibur Sarah. There's a sense to it. There's a mystery in that. There's a mystery that the two Mashiach must always be together. The person says, the Mashiach for Yosef, the Mashiach for David, and they will be in my hand as one branch. Always. These two Messianic partners will be together. Always will be together. And that's a mystery. Why should they be together? Now we understand. Because one represents Sahara, the other represents Kedusha. And once, once other Russian sinned, he paralyzed the Mashiach ben David. He paralyzed the plot of Kedusha. Because he removed its energy. Hence, in order for the Mashiach ben David to walk, it needs a wheelchair. And you know what that wheelchair is called? The Mashiach ben Yosef. The Mashiach ben Yosef is the wheelchair or the crutches to the Mashiach ben David. And that is a concept for the mystery of the Trey Mashiach. You see. Why these two must be together? Now, how do I know these two need together? Because, you remember the diagram I showed before? You remember that we said that the process of Sahara takes place in different steps? You see, that there are 6,000 years where it takes place. First there's the Tower of the Neshama. That's the most Mashiach. Then there's the Tower of the Gulf. And then there's the Tower of the World. Why is it that the Sahara process is divided over different steps? For that basic reason. It's because the Kedusha process cannot go on on its own. Therefore, what the Bonisham did was to divide the Tahara in progressive stages. So that there's always a Tahara process which in some way can become the crutch or the vessel and the vehicle for a Kedusha process. In Vavna principle, we see there are some critical ideas about existence itself. Ideas that you must take very seriously. The idea of existence as fixed, which should be. The idea of existence as becoming. And the idea of what free will is. That free will is not simply, you succeed now, you fail now, go on for the next day. That the truth of the matter is, according to the real nature of existence, there is no next day. Next day doesn't exist in the world of Khatam. Not really. Not the way God created it. You don't realize that the fact that the world went on for another day after Adam Rishon did a sin was the biggest Rahmanist and mercy that the Bunajan had on all creation. Because according to the laws of creation, according to the laws of existence, there is no such thing as the next day. The act of free will, the act of choosing, is a one time act. And there's an energy involved in that. And there's a change in the becoming involved in that. And once that act is done, it's finished. It could never be again. Because once that act is done, existence has changed. So if existence has changed in the wrong direction, there's nothing you can do about it. But the bunch of created a next day. How? Because he said that the wage of the sin will be more tumor. And once more tumor came in, Suddenly, new energy entered the world because now the Neshama was involved in the act of getting rid of its Tumor. It wasn't involved in the act of acquiring more Kedusha. It couldn't be involved in that anymore because Adam had lost that. So instead, he became involved in the act of getting rid of the, the mess that he had energy for. You see? Because it's simply winding up the spring from the back. But the question you may say, well, that may be fine. You may wind it up further back. So therefore, all we have energy now is to clean ourselves off. But where are we going to get the energy of picking ourselves up? The answer is we will never get that energy. Because that energy was really spent. But, if you can duplicate, if you can double up on the process while the act of cleaning up is taking place, then you can what? You can see in. You can plug into that extra source of energy. You can do that. Hence, you can still get back to where you are. But you must do it concurrently, not consecutively.
we see very clearly that if Kedusha was done first, if Kedusha Sahara was done separately, there would be no Kedusha Sahara. There would be no next day. There's no such thing in Kedusha Sahara in a consecutive basis. Because it cannot exist. The laws of existence do not make that possible. The laws of existence say that once Kedusha is lost, it is over. It is over. The fact that if Kedusha is lost, that suddenly you gain Tumor, this came from Ahmadis. This is the Mishas HaChet, it's an amazing thing. The fact that the Buddhism gave you the wages of your Chet, a tumor, that he defiled you, that he made you sick, that was the most wonderful thing the Buddhism did. When the Buddhism took evil and he put it into the world, that was the best thing that he ever did. You see? Because without the presence of that evil in the world, there would be nothing. Existence would be forfeit. It is the presence of evil in the world. And therefore, the process of removing that evil that allows us all to, to elevate ourselves and to reacquire the Kedusha. That's our saving grace. The essence of redemption lies in Zohama itself. It is Zohama which saves the world. Unbelievable. Incredible, isn't it? What a statement that is. It is Zohama which saves reality. Strange interpretation on evil, isn't it? Strange different way of looking at it. You see here an interesting thing that the Buddhism is different than anything else. The Buddhism can use evil to accomplish good. To us, that's absurd. How is that possible? Because the truth of the matter is, there is no such thing as real evil. That's why. It only appears to be evil. But in reality, there is no such thing as evil in the world. All there is in the world is din. There is existence. And there's no existence. There's fixed existence and there's dynamic existence. That's all that really exists. These are the fundamental laws of reality. Dom and Tumor are not really things in themselves. They were created. Why? So that the world can be saved in spite of itself. That's why. So the Buddhist uses the force of Dharma and the force of evil in order to save men. Man dies to be saved. Man's neshama becomes tame, and he undergoes suffering to be saved, because that's the only way to counteract the intrinsic nature of existence itself. What does it mean for any one of us? It doesn't mean that we should go out and do sin so we can accumulate more zoma and get more energy. That's surely what it does not mean. I don't want people to go out thinking that. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's some hearty souls over here that would draw that conclusion somewhere. What it does mean is that in every act of choosing, every time you're confronted with a mitzvah, every time you're confronted with doing something with the will of the Ganesha, every time you're confronted with obtaining more wisdom or getting closer to God, you are confronted with existence itself. You are confronted with taking existence from one level to another. It's not simply doing what God wants. It's becoming what God wants you to become. You see, it's reality which is at stake. That's what's critical. And number two, what's critical is that that state of existence will only be for a certain period of time. Our time. And time as we know it reflects that. That there will come a time when we no longer have the opportunity to go anywhere. Because we will all have arrived. And we will have arrived to the destination that we will have chosen. And once we arrive at that destination, there are no further destinations. There are no more journeys. There are no more voyages. Once you die, and surely once the year 6000 happens, the last of the adventurers, the last of the explorers, are gone. There are no new, more, more new worlds after that. Not at all. That's why very great Tzadikim don't want the Mashiach to come. Really. Very great Tzadikim. Why? Because when the Mashiach comes, it indicates that reality will achieve a certain level of fixation. Once the Mashiach comes, it means reality will achieve a certain level of Sahara. Once it has achieved that level of Sahara, it means that the Kedusha is no longer necessary. Well, that means that the opportunity that you had before the Mashiach, the Mashiach came is no longer available. You see? Whereas now you can all become millionaires, once you might in Mithras, now once you might, the Mashiach comes, you maybe can collect a couple of thousand dollars. That's it. 
that's the full extent of your fortune once the Mashiach arrives. That's it. You are no more millionaires after the Mashiach comes. And after the Tchir Samesim, your fortune is restricted in the hundreds. Because as it goes closer and closer to the year 6000 and the Sahara is finishing up, the ability to acquire the fortune is diminished. Your opportunity is diminished. And you're slowly going closer and closer into a state of suspended, fixed animation. You begin to congeal like in a freezer. You freeze up. And that's it. That's why Tadikim don't want the Mashiach to come. Because they don't want to lose that blessed opportunity, which will never again exist. Never again. Okay, yeah. That's so the the Ramban said this in his debate with the Christians. Because they, when they were saying about Jesus in the world, he was saying, I'm a country. He was saying this, and he said this, and the Ramban said this, it's very clear, that they want the Mashiach to come for one reason, and they don't want to come for another. It's ambivalent. Yeah. Every Tzadik wants to go to Elam Habarei because he's tired. He wants to be in a place where he's going to sit and he's going to be free of the tension and the turmoil of Olam Azair. So he wants that. The opposite says, in opposite says what? Two opposite statements. It says, yes, in opposite says two opposite statements. It says, one hour in Olam Azair is better than all of Olam Habar and that one hour of Olam Habar or Ahaba is better than all of Olam Hazir. There are two contrary statements. Because when you refer to the manuha, to the tranquility, to the peace, to the simcha, how can you compare our turbulent world to Elam Haba? But when it comes to the aspect of the opportunity, you see, it depends on which criteria. And the truth is, Tzadikim are ambivalent. And that's what it is. They want Elam Haba, but they want it pushed off. Because they know that once the Muslim Mashiach arrives, once Elam Haba is here, then there's less and less of the ability to get more Olam Haba. As long as Olam Haba hasn't arrived, you can expand on your wealth. Yeah. I would think that a real study would want more than just for himself. And wanting for the world and the shield to come, he would make that great leap that would bring him more Olam Haba than if he didn't want the shield. You can look at what... You can look at it in different ways. You want to look at the last question? You want to say that this is on the contrary, that a tzad is giving up on him there so that the Mashiach would come so that everyone could be in the past. You're right, that is a certain level of Mashiach's nefesh. That's another way to look at it. So, there are a number of different ways to look at it, you see. But all of these different ways are legitimate. Why? Because basically about the ideas that I've said, those ideas remain constant. And these are the ideas which are true, you see. What your cheshven is depends on your madrega. You see. If you're on a very high madrega, and so on, and you're really into mistress, and you realize precious each moment is, you want to prolong your life. You want to prolong what you have to acquire more and more. I will. But, no, no, no. But, if you feel that in doing so, other people may be losing out, or whatever the situation, you want the emotional shift to come, that's another cheshven, that's another madrega. All of these things are true, depending on the madrega of the person. But that doesn't mean necessarily that one is superior or not. You have to understand the nature of Voida. It's not so simple. Your love for mankind may be very, very lofty. But part of it is also based on, I think, on the fact that you're not clearly aware of, of the individual capacity as well. I, I don't really... That's how they truly... See, a tzaddik is a person who doesn't waste a minute, really. Because a tzaddik knows the value of a minute, you see. The person says, well, we want the Mashiach to come, really, because everyone can be benefited, and don't worry, I'll give up my minute. That's a person who really doesn't understand what a minute really is. Now, a person who really does understand and gives it up is on a very high madriga. But in order to get to that madriga, you first have to be on the level where you are envious of every minute. If you are not on a madrega, where every minute is so vital and critical, you cannot reach the higher madrega of giving